Thank you. That concludes general questions. Members will be aware that tomorrow is the first anniversary of the passing of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. In the days that followed her passing, the Parliament came together to convey our sincere condolences to the Royal Family and to lead with people across Scotland tributes to Queen Elizabeth's remarkable life and, in particular, her bond with this Parliament. And in view of tomorrow's anniversary, we will have contributions from leaders before we move to First Minister's questions. And I call the First Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One year since the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, it does present a moment for reflection on a long and dedicated life of public service. I'm sure that colleagues will remember with great pride the beauty of Scotland's landscapes, but perhaps more importantly, the warmth of Scotland's people on Her Majesty's final journey. Her Majesty's deep fondness for Scotland was well known. It is here that Queen Elizabeth chose to spend her most private family moments each summer. And it is within the halls and gardens of the Palace of Holyrood House that Her Majesty welcomed thousands of community leaders, volunteers, artists, activists, faith leaders, and essential and key workers in recognition of their service to Scotland. Presiding officer, on behalf of the people of Scotland, I send my thoughts to King Charles and the royal family in their private remembrance tomorrow. Thank you. And I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Tomorrow our thoughts will be with the King and the Royal Family on the first anniversary of the passing of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Twelve months ago, thousands of Scots gathered as her cortege made the final poignant six-hour journey from Balmoral to Holyrood Palace as she had wished. Flowers marked the route in Ballater, bagpipes played in a boin, farmers lined their tractors on the roadside, and thousands stood on the Royal Mile to pay their last respects. Our late Queen brought the country together in her life and in her death. The late Queen cherished Scotland, and in her passing, the country showed how much it cherished her. Tomorrow marks one year since we lost our late Queen, but every day since then we've remembered her warmth, her leadership, and her unstinting and dedicated service to this country for 70 years. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, our longest serving monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, was a dedicated public servant, demonstrating strength, leadership and empathy when her country needed it the most. She brought our nation together at times of crises and left a legacy of compassion in the various causes she championed. She reminded us that despite our political disagreements and arguments, everyone here in Holyrood is here because in the service of the Scottish people. Her kindness, wisdom and integrity are timeless values that will be passed down through the generations. Scotland will remember her fondly. Thank you. And I call Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the passing of Her Majesty ended a constancy in the lives of everyone in this chamber. It was a moment in time that will come to define the early years of this century. And across these islands, the Commonwealth and indeed the whole world, there was a collective sigh of sadness and thanksgiving for her life of service. And then, in the minutes and hours and days that followed the announcement from the palace, Operation Unicorn unfolded with quiet precision. And I pay particular tribute to the staff of this parliament and public service workers across Scotland for the many hours and days they dedicated to that task. From the roadsides of Aberdeenshire to the catafalque at Westminster Hall, those days showed Scotland and the United Kingdom at its very best. I think Her Majesty would have been pleased that so many marked her passing by engaging in the great British pastime of standing in line. So on this anniversary and all those to come, we hold the royal family in our thoughts and remember the extraordinary life and service of Queen Elizabeth II. Thank you. And we will now move on to the next item of business, which is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I remind the Chamber that my wife is a serving officer with Police Scotland. As part of a pilot in the northeast of Scotland, frontline officers have been told to no longer investigate certain crimes. SNP funding cuts are forcing dedicated officers to ignore criminal acts. Some victims of crime will report it to the police only to be told it's not important enough to investigate. So will the First Minister tell us 
which crimes won't be investigated? First Minister. First of all, uh, presiding officer, of course, uh, Police Scotland's funding uh, is not uh, being cut. I'm pleased to say uh, that despite UK government uh, austerity and recognition of the crucial role that police officers play, uh, pay, uh, of course, we've uh, just announced this week uh, an excellent pay offer that yeah. I'm pleased that police officers uh, have uh, accepted. Yeah. And the service is receiving an, an additional £80 million in resource funding in 2023-24. Uh, again, uh, from the North East pilot that Douglas Ross uh, mentions, let me quote directly from the news release that the police put out in that region. It says, on some occasions, crimes are reported where there's no associated threat, no risk, no harm, no vulnerability, and this is the important bit, also no proportionate lines of inquiry for local police officers to investigate. When this happens, our staff will inform the caller that the inquiry has been recorded and a crime reference number will be supplied, but no further action will be taken. That, to me, seems like a proportionate uh, approach to tackling crime, presiding officer. Douglas so, Ross. So the First Minister is quite happy about that. That is incredible. Now, first of all, more pay for our officers is welcome. Fewer officers is not. And that's what we have now in Scotland. And the First Minister cannot dodge responsibility. This is a result of SNP funding cuts, and it's laid clear in the letter that he's just read out from Chief Superintendent Graham Mackey. But this pilot is unfairly treating communities in the North East as guinea pigs. They will receive a poorer service despite paying their taxes like everyone else. In response to this, the Scottish Police Federation Chair David Threadgold said areas could be at increased risk as criminals target places where they know crime won't be investigated. Now, Hamza Youssef wouldn't let this rash experiment happen in Glasgow. So why is he content to let victims in the North East go without justice? First Minister. That is complete and utter nonsense, turning one community in Scotland against another community in Scotland. What else would you expect? What else would you expect from the divisive Conservatives? This, of course, is a policing operational matter. Let me pull up Douglas Ross on a couple of points. First and foremost, Scotland has more police officers per capita than England and Wales. And, of course, on significantly higher pay here in Scotland because we believe in paying our police officers fairly. In Scotland, we have 30 officers per 10,000 of the population in Scotland. That compares to 25 in England and, indeed, in Wales. Let me go back to the central point. What people in Scotland, whether they're in Glasgow or the North East, care about is ensuring that recorded crime is at low levels. And I'm pleased to say, under this SNP government, recorded crime continues to be at one of the lowest levels ever since 1974, down 42% since 2006-2007. Douglas Ross. North East families shouldn't be paying the price for SNP funding cuts, and that is what is happening here. The Scottish Police Federation said this pilot could set a dangerous precedent. Officers are warning that this could be a slippery slope unless Hamza Youssef steps in with more funding. And even today, Audrey Nicholl, the SNP, MSP and convener of this Parliament's Justice Committee, has raised concerns about what is happening in the North East of Scotland. So will the First Minister tell us, is he going to act on these concerns or is he going to let this happen across the country? First Minister. If Douglas Ross uh, does not uh, correct the record after the session, then he is, frankly, uh, he is frankly happy to be inaccurate and misleading. Because let me read again the facts. We are investing £1.45 in policing in 2023-24, increasing the resource budget, increasing by 6.3%, an additional £80 million. So any suggestion that we're cutting funding, I'm afraid, is simply untrue. Let me go back to the North East uh, Police, uh, the, the, the press release that was sent out by the police in the North East, because this is an operational matter. Again, if crimes are reported and there's no associated threat, risk, harm or vulnerability, and no proportionate lines of inquiry, then, of course, officers will give, a, will give a crime reference number, the crime will be recorded, but no further action will be taken. So on this side uh, of the chamber, presiding officer, we are ensuring our police are funded, we're ensuring there's more police officers on the street, but crucially, we're ensuring that recorded crime remains at one of the lowest levels in 42 years. Thank you, 
I think if anyone's going to be correcting the record, it's the First Minister, because of course we know that the Police Scotland's budgeted officer establishment has reduced from uh, 17,234 to 16,600. There are less police officers on the beat in Scotland, and they are being told not to investigate crimes. And why are they being told? It's because of funding. And if the First Minister won't believe what I'm saying, maybe he'll listen to Deputy Chief Constable Fiona Thompson. She said the force is facing hard choices. She continued, the levels of service we provide to the public will inevitably reduce. First Minister, this is a direct consequence of SNP funding cuts. Officers don't have the resources to do their jobs. People who report crimes will be told, tough luck, and it's open season for criminals under the SNP. So why is the First Minister telling offenders that they can break the law and get away with it here in Scotland? First Minister. Douglas Ross, with that question, demonstrates why he should never, ever be allowed to be First Minister of this country. Panicking people, alarming people, sensationalism, all for cheap political headlines, presiding officer, is what Douglas Ross is interested in. What we're interested in, presiding officer, is results. Those results see more police officers in Scotland than other parts of the UK per head. What we see is further investment in our police in comparison to the previous year. What we also see is lower recorded crime rates here in Scotland than when we took uh, Let's office. Let's hear the First what Minister. What I would say to Douglas Ross is when he talks about difficult public finances, they're difficult because of Westminster austerity, yeah. because of cuts to our budget, because of austerity. Because of, of course, the disastrous mini-budget that Douglas Ross, just under a year ago, demanded the Scottish Government follow Liz Truss's path. And now he wants to see tax cuts for the wealthiest. So we'll continue to invest in our public services. And let me just say, when it comes to the, comes to the public finances, Douglas Ross has no credibility whatsoever. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. The news this week of the risk of reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete known as RAC in our schools is causing understandable anxiety for parents, pupils and staff. The Government have confirmed that 37 schools have been identified as containing RAC. So can I ask when the Government first became aware of the issue and what steps it took? And also will the Government commit to publishing the list of the, list of the schools impacted so parents and pupils have at least some of the answers they deserve? First Minister. I thank um, Anasawa for his question. Uh, so we were informed uh, and, and about RAC for not just many months, actually, for uh, years. And that's why, for example, we ensured that our education leaders had the appropriate guidance from the Institute of Structural Engineers uh, last year. And we have been proactive over that period, particularly uh, the Education Secretary has been proactive in relation to her discussions with local authorities to ensure we have a full understanding of the picture. I can confirm that, uh, given that we have further information back from local authorities, that 40 schools have been identified that have RAC in them, uh, and of course the appropriate mitigations have been put in place. In terms of Anna Sauer's direct question, I think it's a very fair question, uh, yes, we will work with local authorities to ensure that that information is published. I would expect that publication to happen at the end of the week, not just a list of the schools that have been affected, but I think if we can give more information around the mitigations in place, that will give some confidence to parents uh, and indeed to pupils and staff uh, who are in those schools. So we are working with local authorities to ensure that information is published. And there is, of course, a statement later this afternoon uh, where the Cabinet Secretary will lay some of that detail out. Anna Sarwa. First Minister, the Institute of Engineers uh, say they began inspections in schools for RAC in 2018. And the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service say they warned that buildings are at risk of collapse two years ago. So it is important to know what steps the government took, especially as the First Minister said it, they have known about this for years. Specifically on the schools impacted, how many schools have either a partial or complete closure? How many are subject to the additional building works or emergency engineering support? And finally, what resources are being made available to local authorities to deal with these affected buildings? First Minister. So there's a number of uh, questions, which again, I'm happy if we don't get to the detail of to write to Anna Sawar uh, in, in, in full detail. In terms of the mitigations in place, they vary from school to school to school. So various schools, for example, and uh, other public sector uh, owners of public sector buildings, they have taken a number of mitigations. If I take local authorities and schools, for example, St Ken uh, Kentigern's Academy in West Lothian, they've closed part uh, of its estate, including the dining and kitchen areas, Preston Lodge High School, and East Lothian has closed off impacted classrooms and other areas. So each school 
uh, will determine, given the uh, Institute of Structural Engineers' guidance, will then uh, choose to take the appropriate mitigation in place. Uh, fire stations, of course, that have been uh, affected uh, as well, uh, they already have uh, put mitigation uh, in place. And again, I'm happy to furnish uh, Anna Sawar with some of the detail. In terms of funding, uh, we are, of course, aware of some local authorities uh, wanting a discussion in around funding, and of course, we'll continue to have those discussions with local authorities, but ultimately, they are the ones who are responsible for the safety of the school estate. I did note the Chancellor of the UK, the Prime Minister, in fact, of the UK, say funding will be made in order to help with mitigations uh, in relation to RAC, uh, but I've seen in the last 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, them roll back on that commitment. So we'll continue uh, to have conversations with the UK Government. In fact, uh, the Deputy First Minister wrote to the Treasury on the 16th of August uh, last month to call for the alloca uh, allocation of additional funding to remediate RAC. But I know there's a number of questions Anna Sarwar uh, has asked. I'm happy to go back to him in writing with fuller detail. Thank you. Anna Sarwar. I, I welcome the commitment to publish a list of schools. And can I ask that uh, public information to include what mitigations are taking place in those schools to give that reassurance to patients? Uh, sorry, to parents. Uh, the government have delayed the next phase of their school rebuilding programme. Uh, local authorities submitted bids a year ago. They were meant to get an answer by the end of 2022. And we know that at least five of, the, five of the schools on that list contain RAC, although I suspect that number will be far higher. Those schools are still waiting, so this must be dealt with urgently. And this issue also goes beyond our schools. We know that 255 NHS buildings across Scotland are being surveyed for suspected RAC. So can I ask the First Minister when these surveys will be completed, when we'll have a complete list of all public bodies affected, and how soon will we have a timetable for any required remedial action so we can give patients, staff, parents and pupils the reassurances they deserve. First Minister. Again, I'm, I'm more than happy to furnish Anna Sauer with further detailed writing if I'm not able to get uh, to all the questions he answered. In terms of the school estate, uh, we'll be making a decision on LEAP imminently, but we are also now looking uh, at that programme through uh, a, a RAC lens. I think it's important for us to do so. This government does have a, a good record when it comes to building uh, schools or indeed substantial yeah. refurbishment of schools since 2007-08. Uh, we've um, uh, had 1,098 school builds or indeed uh, substantial refurbishment projects that have taken place. And of course, uh, Anasar will be aware that school estate statistics came out uh, just a couple of days ago and they show that 91% of schools in Scotland had a good uh, or satisfactory condition uh, rating that significantly improved from when we first uh, took uh, office. In terms of uh, the NHS, uh, that a major study is already uh, very much uh, underway. Uh, NHS Scotland Assure are leading uh, that. The desktop uh, review exercise that took place that uh, showed that 254 buildings have two or more characteristics consistent with the presence of RAC. And the next phase of the survey has commenced and nine buildings have now been confirmed to contain uh, rack. That's from 40 buildings that have been surveyed. But I think, uh, going back to Anna Sauer's very original point, I think it's a fair one, uh, we will work with partners, not just local authorities, but NHS boards and others, to see uh, how much of that information can be put out publicly. I hope Anna Sauer and others will appreciate uh, that that will be an evolving picture as these surveys continue uh, to progress. Thank you. Question number three, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to data showing that the attainment gap has increased. First Minister. In fact, the poverty-related attainment gap is narrower than it was pre-pandemic for National Fives, for hires and advanced hires. This, this shows progress in education recovery and closing the poverty-related attainment gap over, over the longer term. We've seen good progress in primary school literacy and numeracy, the latest data showing the biggest ever reduction in the gap. We've seen a record low poverty-related attainment gap and positive destinations for school leavers nine months after leaving school, with record high numbers of students from deprived areas entering university in 21-22. All this, plus the ambitious aims local authorities have set and indeed are setting for the longer term, it gives me great confidence that we're making good progress and our £1 billion investment in the Scottish Attainment Challenge is indeed having an impact. Liam Kerr. The First Minister chooses his data carefully, yet fails to acknowledge that the attainment gap between the least and most deprived pupils has widened for the third year in a row. And we must be clear that this is through no fault of teachers, pupils or staff. Now, whilst his predecessor promised to eliminate the attainment gap, his ambition, as set out in the programme for government, is limited to merely 
narrowing it. So what narrowed gap would be acceptable to this First Minister? And when does he project he'll deliver it? First Minister. First of all, uh, of course, Liam Kerr is not comparing like for like. We are comparing, of course, this year's figures compared to pre-pandemic uh, figures. And of course, Liam Kerr, what I would say to him is the emphasis that he forgets to put is that this is, this is of course, a poverty related yeah, attainment gap. That. And that's the very point, presiding officer, that poverty related attainment gap. If Liam Kerr really cared about tackling, tackling it, he would use any of the, the minuscule influence he has within his, within his own party to demand that they scrap the two-child limit, to demand that they, that they scrap or reverse the reduction in universal credit, that they scrap, uh, of course, the benefits freeze. Those three measures alone would lift 30,000 children in Scotland out of poverty. So while Liam Kerr may well wipe away those crocodile tears, we in this Scottish Government will get on with the job of protecting Scots from the harm of a Westminster cost of living crisis. I call Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I thank the First Minister for his answer to that question, but in many areas in Scotland, including Glasgow, the Attainment Challenge funding is being used to backfill cuts to core education funding. So can I ask the First Minister, why does he think that is? And does he accept that this dedicated funding put in place to tackle the attainment gap has failed to do so in a substantial way? First Minister. No, I've just uh, said to the previous member, of course, that we are making uh, inroads in relation to narrowing the poverty-related attainment gap. And, of course, when it comes to funding for local authorities, that funding uh, has increased in comparison to the last financial year. And what we're doing with that £1 billion Scottish attainment challenge is making sure that we're giving £520 million to the pupil equity funding for head teachers, direct funding also for all 32 local authorities for the first time, and additional funding to support care experienced children and young people's attainment and wellbeing. What I would say to Pam Duncan Glancy, who I know cares deeply about these matters, is that we can only go so far in relation to the poverty related attainment gap. Because when it comes to reducing and tackling poverty, we have some of the powers, but I'm afraid the substantial levers are still in the hands of a Conservative UK government. I want to change that. I hope but Pam Duncan Glancy does too. Question number four, Emma Harper. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on the steps that are being taken to reduce drug deaths in Scotland. First Minister. We remain absolutely committed to delivering the national mission to reduce drugs deaths and improve lives of those that are affected by drugs. The latest drug death statistics that uh, reported a 21 per cent decrease in 2022. I do welcome uh, that reduction, which is the highest on record, but I'm also quite clear that these numbers, of course, remain far too high, and every life lost is an absolute tragedy. tragedy. My thoughts uh, are with the families that have been impacted and affected. That is why the national mission includes an additional £250 million investment over the course of this parliament to improve services and backs radical approaches that are evidence-based. That phrase uh, is absolutely crucial, uh, whether that be a proposal to establish a safer drugs consumption facility or arguing for drug law reform. The Minister for Drugs and Alcohol Policy uh, will make a statement later this month to update parliament more fully. Thank you. Emma Harper. I thank the First Minister for that response. The Misuse of Drugs Act is over 50 years old. It is not fit for purpose and it must be reviewed urgently. And the, Home Office, the Home Affairs Committee recently published a report calling for a re review of drug classification and a new health-led approach to tackling drugs with a trial of safe, safe consumption rooms. So can the First Minister provide an update as to what engagement the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding, regarding the urgent need to reform of the drug Misuse of Drugs Act. First Minister. The points Emma Harper makes uh, are well made. And in July, the Scottish Government did publish a paper, as Emma Harper said, setting out our bold and ambitious proposals for drug law reform to ensure we treat problematic drug use as a health, not a criminal matter. And I was heartened that there was much support for it, not just domestically, but internationally and globally, uh, from experts and those who are working on the ground to tackle the issue of drugs misuse. Uh, this is uh, complemented uh, by the recent very welcome report, uh, as Emma Harper said, from the Home Affairs Select uh, Committee, which is clear for the need 
to reform the Misuse of Drugs Act. Uh, the Minister for Drugs and Alcohol Policy did meet with the UK Minister for Policing on Tuesday this week and did raise the issues with him. Uh, and what I would say is that if the UK Government won't take the necessary actions to use the powers that they have to help us to combat this challenge, this problem, this crisis, then at least devolve the powers to us so we can take a different approach here in Scotland. Call Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the Dogs Against Drugs charity assists Police Scotland with search and seizure of illegal drugs arriving in Shetland alongside its educational preventative work. Police Scotland's Shetland Area Commander has credited the dogs with a vital role in drug seizures in Shetland, with a value of around 750,000 in the last 18 months. And one dog, Do Thor, is retiring and is credited to have found an estimated £1 million worth of illegal drugs over its nine-year career. But without core funding, the charity's future is under threat, and if it ceases, it will likely cost the taxpayer more in the long run. And I have recently met with the Justice Secretary to discuss the issues. But I wonder if the First Minister would agree with me that Dogs Against Drugs is an important asset to both Police Scotland and the Shetland community, and that it would be a significant loss were it to cease. First Minister. I do agree with uh, Beatrice uh, Wisher. I know uh, of the uh, programme uh, Dogs Against Drugs. I remember them well when I was Justice Secretary and funding I know has been a, an issue for a long period of time and that's why I was pleased uh, that the, that the, that the uh, uh, organisation did receive some additional funding I think from the Serious Organised Crime uh, Task Force. Uh, I believe it was a good meeting between the Justice Secretary and Beatrice Wishart uh, and of course uh, if there's anything more we can do to try to support Dogs Against Drugs then of course we'll be uh, open to that in a very difficult uh, financial, uh, within the difficult financial circumstances we're operating in. Question number five, Michael Mara. To ask the First Minister, following the publication of NHS Tayside's due diligence review of documentation held relating to Professor Eljamel, whether the Scottish Government will immediately approve an independent public inquiry. First Minister. This is a deeply important issue, and I can inform the Chamber today that Health Secretary Michael Matheson will use his statement to the Chamber this afternoon to confirm that uh, he, that the government has decided to commission a full independent public inquiry. This comes after very careful consideration of the recent due diligence review, which said concerns about Professor El Jamel, Jamel were not acted on with the urgency they deserved. In commissioning an inquiry, it remains important that those people directly affected are still supported to find the answers they need and that both staff and patients across Scotland know that lessons are being learned. The Cabinet Secretary has uh, considered the latest report on uh, NHS Tayside and uh, we have collectively concluded that this requires investigation independent of both the Board and indeed of the Scottish Government and I agree uh, with that. Uh, he will set out, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health will set out the details of the next steps in his statement this afternoon. Michael Mara. Scottish Labour welcomes that inquiry. It should not have taken us so long to get here. This inquiry has been wrung out of the government like blood from a stone by Jules Rose, Pat Kelly and the many victims who were weeping outside this parliament yesterday, many in permanent debilitating pain. As late as last week, the First Minister and Health Secretary maintained the public inquiry would not take place. And that damning internal review that he mentions uh, from NHS Tayside says they knew El Jamel was incapable and dishonest and yet allowed him to continue unchecked. That review also revealed that the NHS Tayside Board has done nothing to deliver on a raft of recommendations from previous reports into this scandal. What will the First Minister do today to ensure those recommendations are acted on immediately? First Minister. Can I say that um, I disagree with Michael Mara's uh, characterisation. Both the Health Secretary and I have always said that a public inquiry has not been ruled out. But I hope Michael Mara would understand that it is appropriate that we allow reviews like the due diligence review that was taking place to, to, to progress uh, right to the end of its conclusion. And in doing so, having seen the uh, extremely disturbing detail of that uh, due diligence review, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Health, and we discussed this at Cabinet on Tuesday, the government has come to the conclusion that a public inquiry is therefore uh, necessary because of the failings that that report has exposed. So let's be clear about two things. First and foremost, that Professor El Jamel is responsible for his despic despicable actions, but where, they are, where there are systemic failings, 
then they must absolutely be uh, exposed, they must be interrogated, and lessons must be learned. And that's why public inquiry is so importantly. And secondly, let me agree on a point of consensus with Michael uh, Mara, that while uh, many MSPs, I have to say, deserve uh, credit for raising uh, these uh, issues, it is, of course, to the credit of the brave patients who have spoken out about the suffering that they have due to Jules Rose, Pat Kelly, and many others uh, that have raised these issues. Uh, they deserve the credit uh, for uh, this, uh, public, this announcement around the public inquiry. There is still a further uh, question for us to explore, and Michael Matheson will lay this out in detail in his statement. It is um, whether or not there will need to be another process alongside the public inquiry that answers the very individual patient questions uh, that, 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 that rightly uh, patients have in terms of their individual cases, something that a public inquiry uh, would not necessarily be able to do. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Can I also welcome this decision, but can I pay very considerable tribute to Jules Rose, to Pat Kelly and to all the other patients who for 10 years have been fighting this case. Could I ask the First Minister if, aside from the public inquiry, the Scottish Government will consider a victim support fund for the former patients and their families? First Minister. Again, there are, of course, uh, as Liz Smith knows well, appropriate routes in relation to, to compensation uh, that families can go through when it comes to health boards. Uh, and, and, of course, if there are other uh, avenues that we can explore to support patients, then we will give that consideration. But there are already established avenues for patients who have suffered as a result of the NHS to be able to claim compensation. But they can, at times, be difficult to navigate, uh, so we will give consideration to any uh, other avenues of support that we can provide. I do want to uh, mention that there has been a good cross-party uh, effort in OMSPs uh, such as uh, Shona Robinson, uh, uh, Joe Fitzpatrick, John Swinney, Jim Fairley, Graham Day, Willie Rennie, Michael Mara uh, uh, have all uh, raised uh, these issues. But I think it is important to pay perhaps particular uh, credit to Liz Smith, who has raised these issues for many years uh, diligently and in a considered manner. And I thank all the MSPs who have raised these important issues on behalf of the patients they represent. Question number six, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government plans to maximise the economic benefits, including the number of new jobs, that result from any growth in renewable energy sources, including onshore wind. First Minister. Scotland has the skills, the talent, the resources to become a global renewables powerhouse. We are investing almost £5 billion over this Parliament in the energy transition and finalising an onshore wind sector deal, including halving the average determination time for new Section 36 onshore wind applications, as well as maximising the benefits for Scotland's economy, but crucially also for local communities. We are determined to maximise the opportunities from offshore wind as well, and welcome the commitment of developers to invest an average of £1.5 billion per project in the Scottish economy. We are embracing the opportunities that a flourishing clean hydrogen sector will bring, helping to support jobs, boost energy security and open up export potential. Our finalised energy strategy and, uh, and just transition plan will set how we can maximise those opportunities, including jobs in renewable energy and energy supply chains and a highly skilled, flexible workforce. Ross Greer. Thank you. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Wind power in Scotland is growing. That is good for our climate, jobs and our economy. In fact, onshore renewables grew last year at almost twice the rate in Scotland than in England. And this programme for government will further unlock growth in green energy. In contrast, this week the UK government failed to genuinely lift their absurd wind farm ban in England. The Tories are wrecking our climate and holding back growth in a key industry. But the Scottish Government must do more to capture the benefits of this and other growing green industries for the people of Scotland. So can I ask the First Minister how the new green industrial strategy and the sector deal for onshore wind will create new jobs and supply chain opportunities across Scotland? First Minister. Ross Greer is absolutely right about the damning uh, approach that the UK Government uh, have taken in the face of all the scientific evidence of the climate catastrophe that is unfolding right now. Uh, as I announced uh, this week, we are establishing a sector deal. I think that sector deal will be incredibly important because of the, the, the scale of potential that we have to realise that collective ambition of 20 gigawatts uh, by 2030 and, and deliver that in a way, Ross Greer is absolutely right, in a way that, that benefits local uh, communities. And that's why this deal that uh, we are negotiating will enable increased investment in skills, training uh, and indeed in additional investment in uh, communities. It will create pathways for long-term sustainable energy jobs, supply chains 
with a focus particularly on the circular economy opportunities. Uh, furthermore, uh, building on our uh, final energy strategy and just transition plan, uh, we will work closely with businesses and industry to develop that green industrial strategy by uh, summer of next year. This will set out how we will help businesses and investors create good, well-paid jobs as part of our fair, green and growing economy. Ivan McKee. Uh, industry, including Industry Body Scottish Renewables, is clear that to maximise the economic opportunities from renewable energy, there is a need for a robust, evidence-led, action-driven green industrial strategy, including addressing challenges on skills and investment that government and industry can deliver on together. Can I ask what plans the government has to bring forward that strategy and the timescales involved? First Minister. Okay, we will uh, work closely with business and industry to develop a green industrial strategy by summer uh, of next year, setting out how the Scottish Government will help businesses and investors to realise the enormous economic opportunities, including jobs of the global transition to net zero. The strategy will build on that final energy uh, strategy and just transition plan to offer that clear evidence-based uh, evidence view of the economic sectors and industries in which we have the greatest strengths and most uh, potential. We'll do everything we can to support them to thrive. Of course, some of these levers are very much in our hands. Uh, many of them, particularly when it comes to incentives, tax incentives, financial incentives, lie with the UK government. And that's why I wrote to the UK government uh, this week to urge them to have a discussion and around some of the good ideas that I think were in the Hunter Foundation report uh, by Sir Tom, Hunt, uh, Sir Tom Hunter's foundation around using the, the uh, economic levers, whether they are in the Scottish Government's hands or indeed in the UK Government's hands, to their maximum effect to boost growing sectors like the renewable sector in Scotland. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, over recent weeks there have been continued disturbances at the new prison facility HMPYOI Stirling, which is causing great distress to local residents. The incidents include screaming, shouting, swearing and banging coming from the prison at all times of day and night since it opened. Therefore, First Minister, what action can the Scottish Government put in place, together with the Scottish Prison Service, to tackle and rectify these disturbances, which are being described by locals as a living hell, and support these vulnerable offenders? First Minister. Well, we certainly don't want local communities uh, to be disturbed, to be inconvenienced uh, in uh, the way that Alexander Stewart uh, articulates. So I will ask the Cabinet Secretary for Justice to write to Alexander Stewart to see what more can be done. Uh, of course, the prison service uh, takes its obligations seriously to the young people in particular uh, that uh, are within their facilities in order to hopefully aid rehabilitation uh, and, and, and to also take their obligation very seriously in terms of the community's uh, that they are in. So I will ask the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, uh, who undoubtedly raises these, these issues uh, with uh, the Scottish Prison Service, to also uh, meet with uh, the member uh, and see what more can be done. Christine Graham. Oh, I thought, I thought I'd been dismissed. Um, thank you. Uh, recently, it's been reported that Nature Scott, over five years, issued 46,985 licences authorising the culling of native wild species, including thousands of geese, also ravens and the iconic mountain hare. Does the First Minister share the concerns of animal welfare organisations, and indeed myself, at the size of these numbers? And I should have declared an interest as convener of the cross-party group on animal welfare. First Minister. I noticed it took a bit of time as Christine Graham wasn't sure if she was being called. Do forgive her, presiding officer. She's quite new to this parliament. Um, <laughs> in terms of... Uh, in terms of in terms of the serious question uh, that Christine Graham raises, those numbers uh, do, I think, cause us all to pause uh, and to reflect. Nature Scotland, I know, takes the issue of licensed, uh, con licensed control of wild wildlife very, very seriously indeed. And it's only done where there's no alternative licenses are only issued in accordance with strict criteria laid down in law. However, there are occasions when wildlife does need to be controlled, where it presents a risk to human, uh, human health or safety, um, and, and therefore, as I say, these decisions are not taken uh, lightly at all. And these, can, these decisions can also involve, for example, considerations of protecting air safety around airports, safeguarding food production uh, and retail environments and protecting crops in fields uh, as well. As part of the Butte House Agreement, we will undertake a full, full review of the species licensing system during this parliament. But I will also uh, ensure that the appropriate cabinet secretary and minister uh, investigates the numbers that have been raised uh, by Christine Graham and writes back to her with a fuller response. Jackie Bailey. 
COVID rates are rising and two wards at the Vale of Leven Hospital have been closed due to COVID. The number of beds occupied in hospitals across Scotland is also going up putting even more pressure on the NHS. Now, we know that vaccination is an important line of defence, yet there appear to be problems with the vaccination programme. A couple in their 70s booked for their COVID and flu vaccinations, but when they arrived this week at their vaccination centre, they were told that there was no COVID vaccine available. They and 350 other people were sent home. Can the First Minister tell me if he is aware if there is a problem with the supply of vaccine and when will COVID vaccines actually start? First Minister. No, I'm not aware of any problem with uh, the vaccine programme or indeed the vaccine uh, supply or stock. It's a, a good supply and a good stock is my understanding, but I will ask the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care to examine that point in further detail and again uh, write to Jackie uh, Bailey in that regard. Uh, Jackie Bailey is absolutely right. The vaccination is the best form of defence. Uh, in relation to COVID and, and we can't and we are not as a government complacent about the fact that COVID is still within our communities, still um, harming people um, uh, and, and of course still causing impacts to our public services including our NHS and the very specifics of Jackie Bailey uh, would be able to furnish us with the details. Uh, I'll ensure that specific uh, incident is looked or the, those specific incidents are looked into and we'll give her assurance around uh, the vaccination supply and stock. Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The disaster of Brexit that Scotland didn't vote for has, amongst other things, narrowed opportunities for some of our young people. With that in mind, can the First Minister update me on what proportion of school leavers have gone on to positive destinations? First Minister. Well, this summer we had very encouraging statistics indeed that showed that uh, over 93% of 21-22 school leavers were in a positive destination nine months after the end of the school year. That's the highest level since comparable data was first gathered in 2009-2010. And the member is, of course, right to note that Brexit has narrowed opportunities for young people. And one of the most damaging examples of this has been the UK's decision not to participate in Erasmus+. Plus. We're determined to ensure young people, particularly from our most disadvantaged communities, can benefit from educational exchange opportunities. And that's why in the programme for government, uh, I committed to developing the Scottish Education Exchange programme delivering some of the opportunities to our young people which Brexit has robbed them of. But I'm afraid anything we do as an alternative to Erasmus Plus will never quite be as good uh, as the, program, the Erasmus Plus programme in the European Union. And those in Scotland know that the only way Scotland will be able to rejoin the European Union is as an independent nation. Ross McCall. Thank you. The First Minister will be aware of the repeated desecration of the Snowdrop Memorial Garden at Dunfermline Cemetery. Desecration of memorials is detestable. Words cannot describe how detestable these acts of vandalism are and the emotional trauma caused to the families of babies remembered at the site. Instances like these are happening too often and it's left to volunteers to clear up the mess left by mindless vandals. So what more can the Scottish Government do to support our local councils with funding and resources for something as simple as CCTV cameras to deter these horrific crimes and help bring culprits to justice? First Minister. Ros McCall is absolutely right. These are despicable uh, acts. There can be no words of condem condemnation that are strong enough uh, to, uh, to certainly, uh, I think, uh, articulate and express our collective uh, horror at uh, such, uh, such acts of desecration. In terms of uh, what more can be done, I'd be more than happy for the appropriate minister uh, to have uh, uh, conversations with our local government partners to see if there's anything further we can do collectively in order to deter. I would say it's really important also that we try our best to work with uh, anybody who is uh, who, who's desecrating uh, these memorials to see if there's more we can do to hopefully divert them from uh, such uh, despicable uh, behaviour. And of course, the police. Uh, will uh, determine whether or not there are crimes committed uh, and what action can be taken. I do know uh, one of our local uh, councillors, the councillor Naz, I know him uh, well, was one of the volunteers who was involved in cleaning up the baby uh, memorial. Uh, and of course, I, I commend the volunteers uh, for cleaning up uh, the memorial, but it shouldn't be left uh, to volunteers. The desecration shouldn't be taking place in the first place, and therefore the government will reach out to the local authority and see if there's anything more we can do to support them uh, in any action that they're taking to to uh, stop this desecration from happening in the first place. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. Does the First Minister agree with me that the draconian proposals by the UK Government's Transport Commissioner 
about football supporters' buses needs to be shown the red card. First Minister. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I have no idea uh, why these proposals uh, have been uh, touted in Scotland. I have no idea why uh, the, UK gov uh, the UK Traffic Commissioner, the, the UK uh, Government, think these proposals have any place uh, here in Scotland. They are voluntary guidance and therefore I suspect that they will be ignored and I would support uh, that, uh, that uh, action. Um, I align myself very closely with the SFA, uh, indeed the, the SPS, SPFL, the SWFL, many teams across the country uh, who condemn these proposals. And they, they've, they've come forward, I have to say, uh, to Stuart McMillan and to other members without any consultation, without a single word of consultation with uh, Scottish Government uh, ministers, uh, neither with the football authorities or indeed, uh, most importantly, most crucially, I would suggest, with the thousands, if not millions, of football fans yes. who would be negatively impacted Absolutely. by these proposals. So the, the Minister for Sport, uh, Marie Todd, uh, yesterday wrote to the Commissioner to better understand where these ludicrous proposals have come from uh, and the Scottish government, government, fo football governing bodies uh, and football fan organisations have already issued very strong statements setting out their concerns and they have my absolute full support uh, in this. Russell Findlay. Uh, thank you. Uh, three months ago, I asked the First Minister about a murderer and rapist who received a shorter prison sentence due to new under-25 sentencing guidelines. Since then, countless other violent criminals, adults by any definition, have also had their sentences reduced. So can Hamza Yusuf tell the victims, most of whom are women, why his government will not step in and scrap this weak and dangerous practice in the Scottish justice system. First Minister. Of course, the member asked the question knowing fully the answer, that these, of course, are sentencing council guidelines. They are, council, they are guidelines that are not made, derived, approved by the Scottish Government. They are, of course, approved by uh, the senior judiciary. And if they're, I know it can be often quite tempting, given how horrifying some of these cases are, and the cases that Russell Finlay mentions are absolutely horrifying. So I can understand the temptation for MSPs to demand uh, that the government takes action. But of course, if we were to do so, we would be interfering in the very independence of the judiciary, which is a cornerstone of our democracy and a cornerstone of the rule of law. So yes. sentencing decisions are very much for the independent judiciary. I'm sure they will have heard the concerns that Russell Finlay, the concerns that many members have raised. Uh, but it is important to say that that, counsel, that sentencing council uh, guidelines uh, are evidence-based. And what I would say to Russell Finlay to, to end on is that, of course, we have an important bill that will be going through this parliament that puts victims and witnesses at the heart of the justice system, yeah. even more at the heart of the justice system than they are, and I hope that Russell Finlay and the Conservatives will support that bill. Absolutely. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that the new Eye Pavilion in Edinburgh has suffered delay after delay. Over the past few weeks, fresh doubts in its 2027 opening have arisen after NHS Lothian told patients and campaigners that timescales would be confirmed once the Scottish Government had co completed a review of funding and sequencing on a number of capital product projects. So can the First Minister today confirm to Parliament that the new I Pavilion will open in 2027 and will he meet with me and I Pavilion patients to reassure them that the Scottish Government will fund this vital project because it wasn't mentioned in the programme for government. First Minister. And of course, uh, what, what uh, I'd be happy to do is confirm that we are absolutely committed to the I Pavilion. Sarah Boyack is right, there is a capital uh, programme, uh, capital review uh, going on in terms of the, the capital projects that we are funding uh, right across uh, government. That review is very much still ongoing and that's why we're not able to confirm uh, the timelines. But we've had a significant reduction, significant reduction to our capital budget yeah. from the Westminster UK government. And that comes, I'm afraid, uh, has impacts, uh, let alone the disaster of the mini budget last year, which has yeah. meant that inflation costs, construction costs yeah. have risen exponentially. So that's why this capital uh, programmes review has to be undertaken. And of course, when it is complete, uh, we will ensure that Parliament is updated accordingly. I'm sure the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, in fact, would be happy to meet with Sarah Boyack and indeed patients uh, in the local area around their plans in relation to the I Pavilion. 
Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Carol Mockin, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so.